Why do you want to be an investor? Many would probably say that they are interested in investing because it's a way to make money without working. Or that it would be cool to generate wealth by merely outthinking others. Or because they want to be wealthy enough to quit their job and be their own boss. Well, investing can do that for you. But if you only think in terms of what the money generated from investing can bring you, you are missing a bigger point. Investors win both in life and in the markets by finding ways to improve the odds of success. If you act like this, you're not just likely to get richer than most, but also wiser and happier. This is a top 5 takeaway summary of richer, wiser, happier. How the world's greatest investors win in markets and life. Written by William Green. And this is The Swedish Investor, bringing you the best tips and tools for reaching financial freedom through stock market investing. Takeaway number one, be a copycat. A wise man ought always to follow the paths beaten by great men and to imitate those who have been supreme, so that if his ability does not equal theirs, at least it will savor of it. Someone in the investment world who lives by this wisdom is the Indian investor Monish Pabrai. Pabrai has been able to beat the stock market by about 6% per year net of fees since the inception of his Pabrai Investment Fund too. How did he do it? By never coming up with anything smart himself, but simply copying smart ideas from other people. Now, I don't want to sound too harsh here, it was very smart of him to come up with that idea in the first place. Who does he copy? Pabrai uses the hashtag MoneyTalk to get his investment advice. He studies their every move, follows them like a shadow into Tesla, Luna and FTX. Okay, no, he copies Warren Buffett. When Monish Pabrai was getting started in the investing field, he came to the most bizarre realization. Very, very few fund managers on Wall Street were mimicking the obvious success of Warren Buffett and his Berkshire Hathaway. They didn't follow the equivalent of his 10 commandments of the investing world. It was like meeting a group of physicists who didn't believe in gravity. Well, Pabrai chose to be a believer. He studied Buffett thoroughly and cloned pretty much every part of his value investing strategy, right down to the fee structure of his partnership, which Buffett had copied from Benjamin Graham, by the way, so there's some inception here. Pabrai even paid $650,000 in an auction to go to lunch with Buffett. And, of course, he has visited Berkshire Hathaway's annual shareholder meetings on multiple occasions for inspiration. Good afternoon, Mr. Buffett, and good afternoon, Mr. Munger. My name is Monish Pabrai. Good morning, Mr. Buffett, and good morning, Mr. Munger. Uh, my name is Monish Pabrai. Just like Pabrai, we should strive to learn from the best. And not just in investing. In any field we wish to succeed in, we should try to copy the best who did it before us. Takeaway number two. Invert. Always invert. Charlie Munger is famous for saying, All I want to know is where I'm going to die, so I'll never go there. At the time of this writing, Munger has just turned 99, so he must have discovered something important here. What does it mean to invert something? It means turning a problem on its head. Instead of asking, how can I be a great partner? One asks, how can I be a terrible partner? Then you try to backtrack what might get you there and avoid it. For example, cheating is something that could wound a relationship beyond repair. So it might not be such a good idea to down 10 beers in a bar when your partner isn't there, but many other attractive people are. I'm not saying that it would be a good idea to down 10 beers under any circumstances, but I hope you get the point. How do we find an excellent investment in the stock market? Wrong question. How do we avoid ending up with a really shitty investment in the stock market? Now we are on to something. Imagine the whole stock market as a block of marble. You could invest in an index fund and be satisfied with the whole block, but for those that are willing to put in the effort, we can transform this block into a beautiful sculpture by removing bad investment ideas, chipping away at them, one by one by one by one. For starters, 
Many great value investors remove anything that is outside their circle of competence. Bye bye to everything that cannot be understood. Then we kick out businesses with incompetent and or dishonest management. See you later. After this, we look at the prospects of the business. Does it look like something you might want to invest in even 10 years from now? If not, finally, insist on a reasonable price when purchasing this company. There are no strict rules here. The cheaper, the better. I currently don't own a single company with a PE higher than 12. Takeaway number three, focus on the ultra long run. The investor Nick Sleep and his partner Zach started the Nomad Investment Partnership on the 10th of September 2001. To be sure, others have begun their investment journeys during less volatile circumstances, but Sleep and Zach were successful nonetheless. During 14 years, they beat the MSCI World Index by about 800 percentage points. Their secret sauce? Focusing on the ultra long run. Nick Sleep thinks that all information has a shelf life, and he is only interested in learning stuff that is useful for very long. One thing that neither he nor Zach thinks of as useful information is price fluctuations. Therefore, they place their only computer with a Bloomberg terminal, a terribly expensive service that most Wall Streeters view as a status symbol on the short side of a table with no chair. This minimizes the time that they can spend there. Very smart. Instead, they allocate most of their time to devouring annual reports and interviewing people at companies, Phil Fisher style. They are seeking answers to questions such as, where does the company want to be in 10 to 20 years? What must management do today to reach that destination? What could hinder the business from reaching that destination? This approach is worlds apart from the generally accepted rule on Wall Street to focus on the earnings of the next quarter. It's an obvious way to get ahead in the long run. Here's how knowledge accumulates in the mind of someone devoted to information with a long shelf life versus someone only being fed social media and clickbait daily news. Another interesting thing that Sleep and Zach did that shows their dedication to the long run is that they had a truly fair fee structure. They only made money as long as their investors did. This of course helped them maintain great personal relationships with their investors. And having great personal relationships is something old people admit as being one of the most important ingredients for happiness in life. The clearest message that we get from this 75 year study is this. Good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. In a world where everyone is going for instant gratification, and Wall Street is certainly no exception here, the competition for these types of bets on the ultra long run is very low. Therefore, the chance of succeeding is disproportionately high. Takeaway number four. Decisions made under uncertainty. Investors are faced with a peculiar problem. We are playing a game of guessing the future and the rules of the game are elusive and uncertain. Nature, economics, markets, industries, companies, everything is in a constant flux. Yet, investors must bet very real money on these unknowable circumstances. At a first glance, this may seem like some nasty trap set up by a guy from a horror movie, but there are good and bad ways of playing this game. Here are three rules for making decisions under uncertainty. Rule number one is that we must be honest about our limitations. Famed investor Howard Marks has said that, I'll do anything except spend the rest of my life choosing between Merck and Eli Lilly. Nobody's going to get that right more than 50% of the time. Merck and Eli Lilly are two of the largest pharmaceutical companies out there. I think Marx is pointing to two important limitations here. First, he doesn't think that he has an edge against everyone else in really crowded large cap stocks. Second, some industries are just more difficult to predict than others. Who's going to produce the next blockbuster medicine? 
It's a question that's too tough to answer. Rule number two is to use history as a rough guide for the future. A growing company is more likely to continue to grow than a declining one. A cyclical company is more likely to continue to be cyclical than not. A product that has been around for a long time is more likely to stay around than something that has just recently become popular, etc. Rule number three is understanding potential vulnerabilities and actively trying to minimize these. In investing and in life, it's simpler to realize that a risk exists than it is to predict when an event might come along and expose that risk. For example, if you are driving on an icy road in the middle of the night, there is a risk. You don't need to try to predict exactly when or where you might slide off. No, you just lower your speed. The keyword isn't predicting, but preparing. This is super easy to apply to the world of investing too. You can identify friends that are doing the equivalent of driving fast on an icy road by observing if they have a very low number of stocks, say less than five, are concentrated in just a few industries, have a portfolio with a very high average PE ratio, say higher than 25, or are using much leverage. If these friends are boasting high returns, you can congratulate them or you can warn them. The choice is yours. Just don't join them in the car because they may well be sliding off into a tree soon. Takeaway number five, a non-perfect, perfect strategy. According to Joel Greenblatt, the manager of Gotham Capital and the author of the little book that beats the market, the best investment strategy is not the highest returning one but the highest returning one that you are able to stick with. You might hear this and think, well, duh. But from a personal experience, I must say that this is harder to apply than expected. On numerous occasions, both within the field of investing, but also within areas such as working out, productivity and friendship, I've been stuck in the starting blocks because I've been obsessed with optimizing. It's all or nothing. If I can't do it the best way, why bother at all? For example, I went to the gym the other day to train legs. Yes, really. I warmed up and hit the bar to do some squats, because that's what my programming told me to do. But my groin was bothering me, so I couldn't finish the exercise. So I went home. What's the problem here? I forgot why I went to the gym in the first place, which is to stay healthy and probably in this case to build some nice glutes and quads. When I couldn't execute the optimal protocol, I just abandoned the whole thing. Here's another example from the investment world. I started this YouTube channel in mid-2018. For about a year, I was finishing my master's degree and building this channel simultaneously. That didn't leave me with much time to think about individual stocks. When I couldn't pick individual companies, I paused investing altogether. I let all my money just sit in cash. This is really stupid. I should have invested my money in an index fund. My end goal is not to invest in stocks per se. It's to snowball my saved capital. Investing in an index would have satisfied that too. I think that's the key word here. Satisfy. Mostly, you want to strive to be a satisfier rather than an optimizer. Mathematically speaking, if you see a 10 and an 8, but for some reason, it is impossible for you to get the 10 right now. Don't just abandon the 8. 8 is really good. As long as you are directionally correct, you'll get ahead. Keep putting one foot in front of the other, and eventually, you'll see some amazing results. This mindset will not only increase your chances of succeeding, but it will also make you happier on your way towards your goals. Being dissatisfied while getting 8s is a horrible way to live. Sometimes a non-perfect strategy is your perfect strategy. So, to become richer, wiser and happier, you should Copy the best within the field you wish to excel in. Focus on avoiding terrible outcomes just as much as hitting jackpots. Committing to the ultra-long run. Admit limitations, use history as a proxy for the future and decrease vulnerabilities in an uncertain world. And Remember what the military strategist Karl von Clausewitz said. 
The greatest enemy of a good plan is the dream of a perfect plan. Even a non-perfect perfect strategy requires changing your habits. An awesome book that can help you with that is James Clear's Atomic Habits. Check out my 5 takeaways from that one. Cheers guys!